have you ever asked yourself how can i know if i'm a christian <laughs> you see there are people who just say i'm a christian but uh, they, they are not really sure am i a christian for sure am i a, 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 a real christian so my question today is uh, how can i know if i am a christian you see jesus taught that the condition of a person's heart will manifest itself in his or her behavior because he said in the book of uh, luke chapter 6:43 to 45 that no good tree bears bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit and each tree is recognized by its own fruit people do not pick uh, figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars and a good man brings good things out of the good uh, stored up in his heart and an evil man evil things out of the evil which is stored in his heart hmm so when considering whether or not you are a christian you can consider the kind of fruit that is produced in the life of a christian now let me show you a couple of uh, things that you should check out all right a true christian should be completely in trust in jesus death and in resurrection as a sufficient payment for the debt that we owe god a true christian must believe that jesus died for their sins he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture so if you say you're a christian and you don't believe that jesus did this for you then are you really a christian because a christian is one who basically trusts in christ exclusively that's why you're called a christian christ like you follow him if uh, if uh, back in the days people who put their trust in caesar they were caesarians those who put their trust in uh, pharaoh they are I don't know if I call them ferorians or whatever but I'm just trying to show you how somebody can can put their trust in someone and and you just be called after the name of that person. So why are you called a Christian because you have your character and you put all your trust in the man Jesus. Okay? Doubts of course come when we fear. But we must add something to the work of Christ. Uh 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 sorry. Doubts always come when we fear and we always find trying to tell ourselves is there something that i can add to the work of christ for my salvation then when you see yourself you're trying to add something to salvation what does that make you it doesn't make you a christian a christian should not add anything to the work of Christ. Christ did everything for you. So when you find yourself you in a position whereby you you want to add some good works. You want to say okay, Jesus saved me this far, but I can add this and this and this. Then those are not characters of a Christian because the Bible tells us very clearly in Ephesians 2:8:9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Through what? Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. it is not of works lest anyone should boast so is salvation something that you can work for no it is a free gift so that nobody can boast and say it is my good doing that i have done this it is because i helped jesus this far that's why he saved me no you're saved by grace grace is getting what you don't deserve okay and that one makes it clear that we are not saved by own works but we only saved by Christ alone and no matter how righteous we may think or we may appear none of our righteousness comes even near to earning God's salvation you may be a good perfect man who has never lied you don't lie you always say the truth but you're still a sinner you can be someone who does not uh, abuse or steal or fornicate or do whatever there are so many people who never lied who never fornicated do never uh, stole and right now they in hell because the bible told us that if you don't believe in the name of the son of the only uh, of god that is uh, the son of god jesus christ then you're condemned already 
in John 3 verses 18. You're condemned already. Why? Because we are already sinners through Adam. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. You've already sinned. You're a sinner. So even if you say, oh, I'm a good person. No, you're not a good person. You're a sinner and you deserve mercy. It doesn't matter what you've done. It is only by the mercy of God that you can be saved. And also, Romans 5.12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man, who is that man? Adam. <clears throat> by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so does uh, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned you see death entered through Adam it is not because that uh, you know, see there are those people who say but what have I done I don't smoke I don't drink I don't do this I don't fight I don't kill people so how can you tell me I'm a sinner no the Bible says by one man sin entered into the world when you check uh, the book of uh, Genesis chapter 5 verse 3, it says about this man, Adam. Adam, he had already sinned. He was chased away from the Garden of Eden. And then the Bible says, And Adam lived a hundred, uh, 930 years and begot a son in his own image. Not the image of God. In his own image and his own likeness and called his name Seth. Adam is getting a son in his own image why not the image of God because the image of God is perfect and right now Adam is not perfect and all children born in Adam from the seed of Adam they have the sin nature and you know the wages of sin <laughs> the Bible says Romans 6 23 the wages of sin is death is death but of course there's an there's an alternative which is the gift of God. You can decide to receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ our Lord. So we can neither add anything or take anything away from the Savior's sacrifice. When Jesus cried, it is finished. He basically meant it is finished. That he had paid in full the debt of sin for all who trust in him. Everyone who trusts in him it was finished for them. There is no more sin. There is no longer condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is finished. A Christian rests in the gracious promises of God in Christ. Are you resting on that? Are you a Christian? That's how you can know if you are a Christian or not. Number two. A Christian loves to obey obedience. Because a Christian is someone who obeys the Lord. Can you say you're a Christian and you don't obey the Lord? In our rush to magnify the wonderful grace of God, we often treat obedience to God as optional. But the book of John, 1 John chapter 3, from verse 6 to 9, it tells us something here. Listen to this. It tells us, uh, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Are you abiding in Christ? Then you do what is right. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man that does righteousness is righteous, even as is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested so that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his, de for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, this verse might be confusing for many people. It's telling us that we should not have a character of loving sin, continuing doing sin. All right? And uh, when you're saved, you have the seed of God in you, okay? You have the seed of God in you. And when you have the seed of God in you, it already means that uh, you don't... It already means that uh, your, 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 your soul and your spirit have already been redeemed. They cannot sin. You can't sin as a Christian, okay? That is, your soul and spirit cannot sin. Your new creature cannot sin. But of course... 
The flesh does sin because the flesh is not yet saved. And that's why we are waiting for the redemption of our body. And that's why we are told to walk in the spirit so that we may not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Why? Because the flesh is always wanting to sin. But the new man, the new creature inside you, cannot sin. I don't know if you're getting the point. You see, the Bible told us in the book of Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 11 to uh, all the way to 12, it tells us that we were circumcised with circumcision made without hands by God putting off the flesh, the sins of the flesh of the body, the flesh of the sins, so, <laughs> whatever you can go and read there. Uh, I don't have that verse in me right now. But it says that flesh which is sinful was cut aside and God separated the flesh and the new creature. So it means the new creature, my friends, cannot sin. But the flesh, yes, it can sin. So you should walk in the newness of the new man, of the new creature, and don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Because the, f- the flesh and the spirit, they, f- they are fighting, constantly fighting. And when you sin, the Bible says, just go and tell God when you sin in the flesh, go and tell Jesus, who is a our great high priest, our mediator, tell him, Jesus, uh, I've done this and this and this. I'm sorry. Please help me out. And definitely, he's going to forgive us. He has told us that he's faithful. He's going to forgive us. All right? This is only for fellowship. Fellowship between us and God. Because when we continue sinning in the flesh deliberately, we quench the Holy Spirit. Quenching does not mean he goes. It means we dilute until we don't we no longer almost don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's very important for you as a Christian to feel the Holy Spirit because He is our guide, He's our trainer, He's our tutor. Alright? So now, when you look at that uh, first John 3, 6 to 9, which has just read you earlier on, it is says that a person's attitude towards sin is how we tell who belongs to God and who belongs to the devil. Salvation transforms our hearts, all right? You may say, okay, I'm saved, but uh, my heart is still the same. No, salvation transforms us. Because the Bible in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So you should be transformed. And Romans chapter 6 gives a thorough explanation of why we turn from sin when we are saved. Because we have died to eat we have died to sin and we are now alive in christ are you going to take a shower and wear the same dirty clothes no you're going to take a shower and uh, wear new clothes of course you can still wear the dirty clothes if you want you're still fresh you've taken a shower but is it worth it no why are you going to wear the same old greasy dirty sweaty smelly clothes when you have new clothes beside you and you have already taken a shower. That's exactly how salvation is like. You are now new in Christ. Why do you want to live the old way? You should die to sin because you are now alive in Christ. You died and you are now alive in Christ. And the attitude of a true follower of Jesus is one of sorrow over sin. You should sorrow over sin. Feel bad when you do something wrong. Feel bad about it. The psalmist David said in, uh, uh, actually not uh, David, this is uh, Solomon. He said in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. Now that does that make some sense? Are you hating evil? Do you enjoy when you're doing something sinful? Then if you enjoy sin, then uh, you should uh, test, prove yourself to see if you're in the faith. The Apostle Paul told us that. Prove yourselves and see if you're in the faith because someone who is saved will not enjoy sin. (laughs) Absolutely no. To sit somewhere where people are blaspheming, uh, blaspheming the name of God, lying and stealing and doing corrupt things and you're feeling nothing and you say you're a Christian, then uh, you should prove your faith test your faith and see am i really believing in jesus because you cannot enjoy sin all right a christian hates his own sin and has a strong desire to turn away from it 
a Christian loves the Lord and shows that love and shows that kind of love through obedience. All right? The Bible says in the uh, the book of John chapter 14 verse 21, he that has my commandments and keepeth them, he he it he He it is that loves me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest to him, myself to him. So do you love God? Then keep his commandments. Now, another way to know if you're a Christian or not is the witness. All right? Do you have the witness? Who is that witness? Who is that comforter? Who is that one who speaks inside you? This person is called the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you feel the witnessing of the Holy Spirit inside you? Telling you this is right, this is wrong. Walk this way, do this way. He's like our guide. He's like uh, the Holy Spirit is like our map. He tells us where to pass, what to do. You know, things like that. He's our witness, all right? Because a Christian is someone who is led and encouraged by the Spirit. Romans 8. 8 verse 16 says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children is the Holy Spirit testifying to your spirit to yourself inside and telling you that you're a child of God or are you still doubting if you're a child of God then if you doubt I'm not saying we don't get into a situation where we find uh, uh, our faith is maybe sometime low and we need encouragement. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying about knowing that you're a child of God because the Holy Spirit will testify to you and tell you that you're a child of God, you're saved. But if you feel inside you that uh, probably you're not, then uh, probably you may, it may be true. So go and test your faith, all right? When we surrender our lives to Jesus, His Holy Spirit comes to indwell us and changes the way we view the world, the way we view ourselves, and the way we view God. And he brings an understanding of spiritual truths that we could never before grasp. Some of the things that we could not understand, like I remember myself, before I got saved, I I was always confused by the Bible. I take the Bible, I read, I'm not understanding anything. I'm just saying, thou, 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 begat, thou. And and I'm wondering, what what is this Bible talking about? It is very flat for me. I can't understand. But now when I got saved, all of a sudden, I start understanding the Bible. I start understanding spiritual truths. I open a verse and immediately God speaks to me through that verse. And I can feel because those are called spiritual truths. And the Bible told us in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You see, for you to remember uh, the things of God and to understand them, you need the Holy Spirit. The reason people don't understand the Bible, they don't understand the things of God, is because they lack the Holy Spirit. And you can't say you have the Holy Spirit, uh, you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're saved. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians 1, uh, 13 to 14, that in whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest of our inheritance, Now think about that. When you believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit, immediately you believe. You see, there are churches, especially the Charismatics and the Pentecostals, who always tell people that uh, getting saved is one occasion and getting the Holy Spirit is another occasion, which is very wrong. Then they must dis- tell us how to dismantle Ephesians 1.13. That after you believe, you are sealed, you get the Holy Spirit immediately. So somebody telling you that you need a day to receive the Holy Spirit, then that's, that, that's a lie because it's not according to the word of God. Are you seeing this one? And the work of that Holy Spirit is to be the assurance of our inheritance, 
we know that we are going to inherit with Christ and also to teach us all things and to guide us and to help us commune with the Father when we don't even know how to pray. Sometimes we don't understand how to pray. But the Bible tells us in Romans 8 verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit makes intercession for us. He helps us. Sometimes we're just saying, "Mm, mm, mm, mm." you don't know what you're saying. You're groaning. You're crying. Maybe you're in a situation and you're just telling God, God, I, I, I don't know God, God. And he understands us. He knows why we are crying. He knows our groanings and he intercedes for us to the Father. All right? And also the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to comfort us. He comforts us and brings us to mind the promises of God. He gives us a knowing that quiets our hearts when when doubts and trouble arise. Have you ever been in times that you just need comfort? Think about this. Sometimes you can doubt, am I really a Christian? But the Holy Spirit comes and tells you, come on, Keith, relax. You're a child of God. Romans 8 verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. Hmm. Relax. You're a child of God. It doesn't matter what situation you're going through. All right? A Christian has confidence of his own or a adoptation uh, or a, a adoption into God's family because of the testimony of the Holy Spirit. All right? The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father before that we could not cry abba father was god your father when you are a sinner lost in your sins no you could not cry abba father but now we have been born into the family of god we are born again and when you are born again you're born into a new family are you seeing this one God the Father is your Father, just as He is the Father of Jesus. So, something else. And also remember, you're also engaged to Jesus. And soon you're going to be married to Jesus. So, do you think God the Father is going to do something wrong to the His son's spouse? It's not going to happen. He loves you just exactly as the way He loves His son, Jesus Christ. So, you're also a child. If you get married or you marry, do you think your your the, the parent of the one that you marry or the one who marries you will treat you like a stranger? No, they will treat you like a member of the family. They'll treat you like their own children. Why? Because now you're married or you're exposed to that, uh, that, that, that child in that family. And that's exactly who we are. We are exposed to Christ. My friend, don't worry. Now, let me tell you something else, how you can know if you're a Christian. Now, something you have to understand is that uh, the love of God's people is a clear picture of if you're a Christian or not. Do you love God's people? You cannot say that uh, you're in a family and you don't love your sisters or your brothers. You're in a family and you hate you. You see people beating your sister along the street and you just walk away. Can you do that? No. Because you love your brothers and your sisters. You hold them esteemly high. You love them so much. You care for them. You provide for them where necessary. You do good to them because they are your brothers and they are your sisters in the same family. They're not strangers. Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? If you love them, then uh, there's a high possibility that you're a Christian. Because a Christian is one who evinces a sincere love for the family of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. 
What is death? Death is just being outside God's presence, outside God's salvation. So, are you alive in Christ or are you still dead in your sins? If you are alive in Christ, then you love your brothers and sisters. You will not enjoy when you see them falling, when you see them, something wrong is happening to them. You will not. Yes, you will correct them, but in love. You will tell them, no, my brother, this is not right. This is not godly. Please use the other way because this way is going to uh, make you uh, uh, have a bad fellowship, relationship with, uh, with our father. That's how we talk to our brothers and our sisters. And once you understand this, you're coming to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel. All right? Although we should love and uh, befriend everyone, even those who are still sinners, even those who are still dead in their sins, we should love them. But uh, Christians naturally gravitate towards other Christians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 uh, to 18 explains why. All right? It explains why. It gives you this picture. It tells you, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? What do you have to do saying that uh, I really enjoy the ways of the wicked? Can darkness and light walk together? Can two people walk together unless they agree? You see, that's, that's the picture of why we find ourselves gravitating towards other Christians. Because they share the same characters with us. Why do you love members of your own family? It is because they know uh, they have the same character almost like you. You're being raised the same way. You have the same rules in the family. You share the same ideas, the same testimonies. So you, you are more so like the same. But can you really say, I enjoy I enjoy the ways of the wicked. Let's say another family. Your neighbors, they are really wicked. They are killers. Are you going to say, I'm really enjoying the company of these killers and maybe you're not a killer? Are you seeing the point here? So that's why it's very important, very, very important for you to know that you're a Christian to check, do I love other brothers and other Christians, other sisters and Christians in the Lord, all right? Do I love them? God's instructions are basically for us to grow in love by serving our brothers and sisters and helping them bear their lords. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 uh, to 14 says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. You already have liberty right now. Only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the whole conclusion of the law. God just wants us to love each other because now we are in a new family. Are you in the family of God? Do you love other brothers? Do you love other sisters? Do you care for them? Do you do what is supposed to be done? That's how you know if you are a member of the new family. Ephesians 5 verse 21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In the fear of God. 1 Peter 1 verse 22 says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unframed love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Love others with a pure heart because a Christian is known for his love for other Christians. John 13 verse 35 By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have, if you have love one to another. Simple. Very simple. Love others. Love your brothers in Christ. Love your sisters in Christ. Care for them just the same way, even in, a, in an earthly setting. You will always love your brothers your sisters. It doesn't matter they, are, they have done what to you or done what or what. You will always be on their side. That's exactly the same way. 
Something else, another way that you can know uh, if you're a Christian or not, is uh, number five, an ongoing discipleship. Discipleship, ongoing discipleship. We understand that a Christian is someone who continues to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You continue in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second Peter 3 verse 18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let me ask you, how can you say you're in a relationship with uh, someone like the way we say we are now in a relationship with Jesus and you don't want to know much about them can you say I'm in a relationship with this woman or this man and I don't want to know what they love what movies they enjoy how they love their uh, their breakfast made how do they love uh, uh, you know the, the kind of movies they enjoy the kind of holidays the kind of uh, gifts they love the kind of tone they enjoy when you talk to them. How can you say you love someone and you don't learn about them? It's not possible. Just the same way we are in a relationship with Jesus. We are exposed to Jesus. We are engaged to Jesus. So we are in a relationship. And if you are in a relationship, then uh, you should be not wanting to know how the other, uh, the other person feels. How do they enjoy? What do they love? Do they love to be played? Do they love when you when you enjoy company with other people, with other gods? Do they enjoy when uh, you do something wrong against them? Do they feel good when you do what is right or when you do what is wrong? You see, you, you have to grow in discipleship. You have to want to understand. You, you, you can't say I'm a Christian and I'm just a Christian. Full stop. That's it. I'm not learning. I'm not reading God's word. I'm not uh, fellowshipping with other brethren to understand what God wants in our lives. I'm not praying. I'm not talking to God. I'm not listening from Him. No, you can't be a Christian when you don't do that. You must have that eagerness and that desire. All right? And Jesus did not call us to be fans, but He called us to be followers. There's a difference between being a fan and a follower. Judas was a fan. He liked Jesus. He enjoyed what Jesus did. He enjoyed probably the miracles, the, the attention that Jesus was getting, but he did not follow Jesus. Because we see Judas, after he denied Jesus, he went and hanged himself. He didn't really care to follow back and go back. But Peter, Peter followed Jesus. He loved Jesus. Even if he denied Jesus three times, when he came back to his senses, he did not go and hang himself like Judas. He repented and went back to following Jesus. You see, there's a big difference between being a fan and being a follower. Some people love Christianity just because, even pastors, they love Christianity because maybe I, I'm getting some good money from you know being a pastor the tithes and the offerings and and the support that i'm getting so i i kind of i kind of enjoy this and they say mm, as long as i can read two three verses and uh, you know get some cool money without sweating and buy myself some good cars and build some nice houses then i kind of like this i'm a fan of christ yeah he's a good guy he makes us to get all these things but are you really a follower and i believe that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 that uh, on that day many will come saying, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons and do great and mighty works in your name? And what will, is he going to tell them? Depart from me, you that worketh iniquity. I never knew you. Look at that statement. Does he say that uh, I knew you until you sinned? Or I knew you for 10 years and then after that I didn't know you no I never knew you why because you were just a fan a fan in the crowd doesn't mean that uh, uh, the celebrity or whoever is on the stage knows them you you can be on the crowd as a fan you just enjoy what uh, the person is doing but are you really a follower because a follower will follow that person wherever they go 
and there are times when the, they will get to meet each other and get to know each other. If you're a follower, you're going to follow that person and you're going to be with him maybe in a place where he's deserted and you can talk and know each other. But a fan just enjoys you when you're on stage. Are you seeing this one? And that's why Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. Because these people, they were in church, yes, casting out demons, doing great, wonderful works, but they were doing them as a fan. They never followed Jesus. They never knew him. Knowing Jesus is doing his will. Knowing Jesus is believing in what he said. That he died for your sins, he was buried and rose again. The third day according to the uh, the scriptures, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You have to believe the gospel for God to know you. How can you say that you are a follower of Christ and you don't even know the gospel? You don't even know how to be saved. You don't even know what Jesus did for you. You just say, oh, Jesus is God, so I think I'm saved. Ah, the Bible says even the devils know that Jesus is the son of God. And actually, they know that and they believe that and they tremble. Does it mean that they are saved because they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the devils? No. They're just, uh, no. That's, that's But we are saved because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, yes. But apart from that, he died for our sins. You see, there's a key point here, dying for our sins. Jesus was not in that cross for his sins. He died for your sins and for my sins. That's the most important thing for you to understand, all right? Now, Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and to take up our crosses and follow him. Like the Bible says in the uh, book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, he said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me daily to take up his cross and follow him what does taking up the cross mean it means denying yourself denying the worldly pleasures you see a cross is not something that you will enjoy who enjoys going to be killed who enjoys persecution no nobody but every day this world whenever you follow christ you're going to find that uh, because this world is not your home, the world is against Christ. And every day you have to die to yourself and say, I'm not going to do that sinful thing. I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to take up my cross to suffer for the sake of Christ. Instead of doing that corrupt deal, instead of uh, uh, stealing from someone, instead of uh, lying to that person like the world wants me to lie, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the cross and follow Christ every day because all Christians go through seasons of greater and lesser growth but there is always an upward move towards God it may at times be two steps forward and one step back but there will always be progress if we continue in the same worldly mindset we had before conversion chances are that we never really converted at all Remember what uh, James told us in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 17? That faith without uh, uh, action is dead. Faith without works is dead. So how can you say that you have faith, but we can't see the fruits? How can you say that you're a member of that family and we don't even see you behaving like them? How can you say you've been adopted into a family of rich people and we have never even seen you one day? looking as if you're a rich person. I'm not saying it's all about riches, but I'm just giving you an example. How can you say you're a member of a family that loves, uh, uh, you know, singing, and I've never seen you even carrying a guitar or carrying a keyboard? You see, you can see say that you're a member of the family of God and you're still doing things in your sinful nature. You see, we are not saved by... We're not saved by works, but works are evidence of true salvation, of true faith. That is what uh, James told us. And also he gave us even examples and told us, was uh, 
Abraham not saved by works? Hmm. I'm sure you can hear this and ask. Uh, I, I mean, was not, sorry, was Abraham's faith not proven by works? Was the faith of Abraham not proven by works? How? He was told by God to believe in him and to go to a place that he will show him. If Abraham could have stayed and he says, okay, God, I believe in you, and he doesn't do what God has asked him, could his faith be real? No. Abraham was told also by God. God told him, Abraham, I want you to go and sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac, for me. He could have said, yeah, 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 that, that's true, God, yeah, I will do it. But then he doesn't do it. Could that be true faith? The woman Rahab could have believed that uh, the Jews were the people of God. And uh, he, 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 he recognizes them. But he was told to put a red ribbon on the window of her, her, uh, her house. If she could not have put that red ribbon, could that faith be real? When he was told that they are going to come and to conquer Jericho, if she could not have put that ribbon, could that faith have been real? No. Why? Because works, they prove the kind of faith that you have. I'm not saying that you're saved by works, but works are evidence of true faith. Okay? Getting the point? Now, let me tell you uh, something here. When God adopts us as his children, he desires that we take on a family resemblance. We look like the family. Okay? In Romans 8 verse 29, he tells us, For whom did he foreknow? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn among many brethren. Jesus knew that uh, he will have other brothers and sisters. That is us. And he knew that for these brothers and sisters to live together in unison and in harmony with him, then uh, these brothers and sisters need to be transformed into his image. We have to be transformed into the character so that we can resemble Jesus. Jesus that doesn't love sin, so even us, if we are getting into the family of God, then we should not love sin. We should hate sin. We should be... Tra- it's, it's like, think about you adopt a child from the streets. This child is dirty, smelly, uh, lacking education, lacking this and that. When you adopt that child, what, what do you usually want that child to do? You want that child to be transformed into the family image. He or she has to take some shower, change clothes, brush their teeth, you know, uh, g- get into class, uh, study a little bit, get a degree or two, uh, start speaking in the language of the family. Uh, if the family is uh, uh, doesn't love uh, corruption, you will make sure that if this child enjoyed corruption, then uh, he has to be transformed into the image of that family. That's exactly what the Bible says. We have to be transformed into the image of Christ slowly and slowly and slowly during this engagement time. We are engaged to Christ. Yes, we were from the ghetto. We were lost. We didn't know anything. And now we are getting into a royalty family. We have to be transformed and now start thinking in the ways of, uh, you know, in, in a royal way, knowing that Our conversations are not here on earth. They are with our family in heaven. We should start conversing in the ways of God, changing the way we talk, changing the way we behave, behaving like Jesus, because now we are no longer in the earthly family, the the family of Adam, no, the family of sinners, no. We are now in the family of God. And even if we have not yet been married officially, and taken out from the ghetto where we are living in this earth where we are still, you know, facing trials and tribulations. But already we have started transforming our minds into a new stature, a new style, a new way. We can always think and say, you see, my God is a, is a king. My father is a king. 
my father is a king and I know I own this and this and this. And here in the ghetto, I don't need to invest anything here in the ghettos. I don't need to do much. I'm only occupying before I get married officially. Just like a woman who has uh, gotten engaged to a rich man who lives in the leafy suburbs and the, that lady is from the ghetto. Uh, when she's engaged and maybe she's to be married in the next six months, does she start, uh, uh, you know, building houses in the ghetto, you know, uh, living like ghetto people? Or is she trying to constantly transform herself before the great day of the marriage? She transforms herself and even her friends. She tells them, hey, do you know that the person who is supposed to marry me lives in the leafy suburbs? I'm going to have a car of my own. I'm going to have a house of my own. I'm going to have some uh, good uh, things when I'll be married. Right now, my spouse can only come and see me, can only give me a few gifts, can only help me through thick and thin here and there. But once I'm married, that will be it. That's exactly salvation, my friends. Every day you're transformed. You're thinking about the future. Your mind is not on these things. That's why the Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. Renew your minds from the things of this world. Stop thinking like the thing. Stop thinking of, I want this, I want this blessing here, I want to this one. Fine, God is going to bless you, but he's not going to bless you to stay there down because he wants you in a different way place he wants you in, in heaven he wants you with his son so even if he's blessing you in the ghetto he's helping you out there in that ghetto that you're living in in this ghetto of this world that you're living in he's slowly transforming you he wants you to change start taking a shower start wearing new clothes start changing your conversations start uh, uh, brushing your teeth Start doing new things. Start changing your conversations. All right? Even your friends. Stop staying all the time with friends who are pulling you into the life of the ghetto. Start mixing up yourself with the royal people. Other children who are living in leafy suburbs or who are supposed to go and also live in those leafy suburbs, start talking to them. Other people who have the same hope like yours, discuss these things. Read the manuals. The manual is the Bible. See, the Bible is saying, okay, this is what's going to happen when we get there. This is what God is going to do to us when we get there. This is the kind of thing that God is going to give us when we get there. This is the kind of inheritance that you're going to get when you get there. See the point? It is always good to examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. The Bible says, test yourselves. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, examine or test yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? What is a reprobate? Someone with a debased mind. Someone who doesn't really understand what they are worth. They don't understand what is happening in their lives. They don't understand. It's like their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Those are reprobates. They don't understand. They are confused. They don't know anything. They are lost. The Bible says, test yourself and know if you're in the faith. Know that you're exposed to Christ and very soon you're heading. You're heading to heaven. You'll be married to Christ. You should be having a lot of joy. And if you question whether or not you're a Christian, then self-examination is in order. Doubts about salvation can be troubling, but false assurances are worse. Thankfully, we have scripture as our guide. We have scripture as our guide. There are specific things that we can look for when determining the validity of our profession of faith. Trust in Christ, obedience to his word, presence of the Holy Spirit, love for God's people, and continued spiritual growth. We don't need to live in doubt, my friends. When Jesus is the Lord of our lives and we and uh, we live to please and honor him, we cannot beyond any double 
or shout a uh, uh, shadow of a doubt. All right? Beyond any small doubt that we are Christians. Matthew 6 verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Do you desire to seek the kingdom of God first? Are you looking forward to do what is right first? Are you looking forward to do the things of God first? Or are you looking to enjoy other things before the things of God? Because if you are enjoying the things of God first, then it shows something is different. You're a child of God. And the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 46, says, And why call me ye Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things which I say? How can you say, Oh, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and you don't do what he says? Why? John 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. What are the commandments of God? It's not uh, the commandments of, uh, of do not kill, do not do this, do not do that. No, we are already away from the law, the law of Moses. The commands of God right now is to follow him, to listen to him, to walk in the spirit, to love others as we love ourselves and to love our God with all our strength, with all our might, with all that we have. That is the commands that he has wanted us to do. You're in a relationship and you're still running after other uh, men, other women. Are you really making the person exposed to you happy? Are you keeping their commands? Are you keeping the, the agreement you made with them? My friends, it's not about the law. It's about seeking to please the person who is exposed us. That is Jesus Christ. And that's how you can know if you're a true Christian or you're a fake Christian. And that's the end of our today's Bible study lesson. Hope it was a blessing to you. Hope you did learn something. And remember, you can always download this podcast to listen later offline or to share to your friends and family. And please don't forget to favorite our podcast and uh, subscribe to our channel so that you can always be notified whenever we post a new Bible study lesson. And if you'd like to get saved or you need uh, step-by-step Bible verses on the order of salvation so that you can well preach to your friends or family, or maybe you just feel led to support our ministry or buy some cool Christian merchandise, kindly visit our website, keithmuoki.com, for more details and breakdown. Otherwise, I hope to see you soon in the next one.